And there's not a more important story uh, for Ypsilanti in this area than the Underground Railroad. Uh, and there's also a lot of myths attached to the Underground Railroad, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through a little bit of those myths. So the first thing that you're seeing there um, uh, is a picture of a relatively recent memorial to the Underground Railroad. Most of our memorials to the Underground Railroad have uh, been um, uh, uh, made in the last 20 or 30 years. And I think that's important to remember as we go through this, that our memory of the Underground Railroad as something as a really important central feature of our history is a relatively new um, uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, what you're seeing here is the Gateway to Freedom, uh, and this is the Detroit side, and the man with his hand uh, uh, reaching to the, uh, uh, the back of another man there and pointing across the Detroit River to freedom and Canada is a man named George de Baptiste, and we will meet him uh, a little bit later uh, with some specific Ypsilanti stories. There is on the other side of the Detroit River uh, uh, in Windsor, also a, um, a statue uh, uh, of people entering uh, Canada and, and relative freedom from the United States. So the, the Detroit River is an incredibly important place in this um, uh, story of the Underground Railroad as a whole. And I'm, let me get, because I've got something on my screen here that's getting in my way. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's begin um, uh, with a little background and the main points that I think is really important that we cover. There's that statue from the front. I think it's really important to remember some main points here as we begin. One, the first main point is slavery was a national, not just a Southern institution. Um, there was, of course, slavery in all parts of colonial America before the American Revolution, uh, including uh, Michigan, what would become the Michigan Territory. And as many people on this call will know, Michigan is settled in part by the French in 1701. And so for 100 years before the Americans took over uh, what is now Michigan, there was slavery here. Uh, and uh, uh, contrary to what many people think about the, the uh, Northwest Territory Act, it didn't uh, abolish slavery if you were already held in slavery here in Michigan. So there are people held in bondage in Michigan into the 1830s and beyond. Uh, the Mexican-American, uh, there's, there's slavery again in the North, uh, in all parts of the North. It, it doesn't have the kind of uh, economic weight it does in most parts of the South. Um, I think that we should be clear that the Mexican-American War uh, was a war to expand slavery. It was a war to expand, expand slave territory. Uh, and it was, um, it was vigorously denounced as such by abolitionists at the time. Uh, but that was a major, um, uh, a major expansion of slavery. Slavery was expanding greatly before the Civil War. It was not dying on its own, as sometimes people would say. It was actually much stronger in 1860 than it was at any point previously. Um, but Black people were at the forefront of their own freedom struggle. And sometimes it seems weird that we have to say this, uh, but the, the attitude, the, the image of the Underground Railroad in our minds and the way we're taught is often of the help given, the aid given to people escaping from slavery. And that means that you can create a white story out of the Underground Railroad. Right? If the Underground Railroad is not primarily about the person escaping slavery, but the person aiding the person escaping slavery, then you can place white people at the center of that story. And of course, there were white people involved in the Underground Railroad. But the Underground Railroad is overwhelmingly, primarily, a Black enterprise. It's, it's, it's embedded in Black communities, where it's an absolute outlier in white communities. Individual freedom was always dependent on expanding freedom and for the destruction of the slave system. And so I think that's also very important to remember. Even if you escaped your own bondage, it didn't mean that your family escaped bondage. It didn't mean that you had rights to freedom, right? So even escaping from slavery, uh, it raised the question, then what do we do about slavery in general, right? And, and so Black people are at the very forefront of their own freedom struggle. The uh, white, white support for the anti-slavery movement is very limited in this country before the 1850s, very limited. 
Uh, the Underground Railroad is also just one part of a many faceted movement to end slavery. Um, if we reduce the underground or we reduce the struggle against slavery to just escaping, uh, you know, individuals escaping slavery, we're really not seeing the whole picture and we're not seeing how the Underground Railroad fits into the struggle against slavery. Um, there were many people who were active on the Underground Railroad who felt that by getting individuals out of slavery that they were helping to undermine slavery as a system. And that is true, they were, but they were undermining it on an individual and not a political basis. And so there needed to be a political struggle around slavery as well as a struggle to get people free. And that, uh, that meant that you were challenging the whole basis of the US government. Um, the slavery is defended by the U.S. government. It is protected and enforced by the federal government. Uh, um, and then that would greatly expand in the 1850s with the Fugitive Slave Act. The act of escaping or aiding escape was, was just one part of the movement. The larger movement can be seen in the political, social, legal, religious, economic, and militant institution developed by those communities built by the Underground Railroad. So what we're going to see is we're going to see Black communities move through the landscape. These are communities born in the freedom struggle who are defined by the struggle against freedom or the struggle against slavery, and they will move through the landscape from Ohio to Canada to Ypsilanti. And I think one of the things we often don't think about when we think about the Underground Railroad is where are people going to? Where are you going to? And where you're going to on the Underground Railroad is a community you can feel safe, protected, and have some amount of self-determination, right? That you can have some control over your own life. That's what you're trying to achieve. So by and large, when you're escaping from slavery, you're going to surround yourself with other people who have escaped from slavery. You're going to feel most comfortable uh, around people who share your experience. So where you're going to is very important and it's gonna play a central role in how we look at our story of the Underground Railroad. So slavery and freedom along the Detroit River, let's just talk a little bit about that. Up to 10% of Detroit is enslaved during the periods of French and British rule. In the early period, in the French period before the 1760s, it was about half Native Americans enslaved and half uh, people of African descent enslaved. And many of those uh, Native American people who were enslaved were Native women who were enslaved to be sexual consorts to the military garrison of the French. That's the, the level of slavery here, right? It's, it's that level of, of uh, debasement. Um, along with people enslaved, uh, again, we, along with African descent, many Native Americans were also enslaved, although the British would... Um, be much more inclined to enslave people of African descent. So you see black slavery, people who are of African descent expand after the 1760s uh, in, in Detroit. And so many of, I, I'm sure in fact, that the first people of African descent to see the area that is now Ypsilanti would have been people who were enslaved by the trading regimes in Detroit and sent to the, um, sent to the various trading posts, one of which was right here in Ypsilanti. Uh, so I, we know that uh, Gabriel Godfrey, who is, was a partial owner of the trading post here in Ypsilanti, was an owner of other human beings, all right? So the first white man to own property in Washtenaw County is a slave owner. And he's a slave owner when he owns that property, despite the Northwest Ordinance outlawing slavery in the Michigan Territory. Uh, the Detroit River becomes a border with the arrival of the United States, right? So remember that this area is one place. The Detroit River is not the border between two countries until the United States arrives here in 1796. And you have a situation where you have some people in that early period fleeing from Canada to come to the United States. And at the same time, people fleeing from the United States to go to Canada because the laws were such that you, you uh, could be enslaved in a place, but you couldn't be brought into Michigan or Canada as a slave. So if you could flee from Canada or Michigan to the other side of the river, you would be free. Uh, Black codes in Michigan in 1827 uh, were enforced. They were quietly repealed in 1838, other like, unlike other area states. So places like Indiana, 
Ohio and Illinois, if you uh, were black and you moved into that state, you would have to get white people to sign an assurity for you. You would have to put $500 up assurity, all of those kinds of things, which made life extremely difficult, even if you were in quotes, free in those areas. Michigan didn't, Michigan quietly repealed their black codes in 1838, which meant that Michigan was at least legally less hostile than many other states in the Great Lakes area. Michigan becomes a state in 1837. And one of the reasons Michigan, uh, now when is Michigan brought into the territory of the United States? 1796. So it's 40 years later until Michigan becomes a state. And one of the reasons it takes so long for Michigan to become a state is because of the federal policy on slave states and free states. To balance, we're talking about the filibuster now in our Senate and to balance the Senate, every free state that joined the union would also have to have a slave state join at the same time to make sure that the slave states had power within the Senate. And so in 1837, when Michigan is finally able to join the union, they are able to do so because a slave state will also join the union and that state is Arkansas. So I think it's really important. Remember, we're talking about this is a national institution for Michigan to even become a state without slavery required a state to be brought into the union with slavery, right? That's what, that's what it required for Michigan to, to not be a slave state. Slavery was outlawed in Canada and most of the British Empire on August 1st, 1834, and that would become Emancipation Day. That's why Emancipation Day is celebrated on August 1st, and it goes back all the way there. So August 1st would have been celebrated in Ypsilanti a decade or two before the Civil War, right? Um, um, so it was what that did, that, that emancipation in the British Empire with some caveats, big caveats like India, it meant that um, Canada was now the place that the only place to go that you could have real freedom. You could vote as a black person in Canada. You could have property rights. You had legal rights in Canada after 1834. And so that meant that that, uh, you know, before 1834, you saw a lot of people trying to escape to Ohio or Illinois. After 1834, you see more and more people trying to get to Canada. Right. And that that will increase the black population in Michigan and Ypsilanti. And so you see a growth in the black population in, in this period, in this area. Black churches in Detroit. Second Baptist is the the oldest black institution in the state of Michigan, it was founded in 1833. Bethel AME is founded in 1839 and St. Matthew's in 1846. Those are all three black churches in Detroit. All three of those black churches still exist. Uh, and all three of those black churches were central to the Underground Railroad. Both Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor have two black churches each with predate, which predate the Civil War. And as a historian, I know that any Northern community that has black churches that predate the Civil War had important black communities before the Civil War. Before the Civil War, there are only uh, around 200,000 free African Americans in the North and about 4.5 million held in bondage in the South. So a relatively small population in the North and for Ypsilanti by 1860 to have about 10% African American population meant that it had a, for a Northern town, a very large percentage of its population was African American. We often uh, think about slavery and its impact on our environment in the South and people who have to, you know, go to schools named after slave owners or live in on streets named after slave owners. But Detroit is full of streets named after slave owners and not, you know, every city, every town has streets named after slave owners. Of course, Ypsilanti does too. Those those streets are Jefferson and Madison and Washington, right? The founding fathers were all slave owners and we name our streets after the founding fathers. Uh, and we're, we, we're used to thinking about the South where there's things named after Lee or Forrest or Long Street or things like that. But in Detroit, of course, half the streets uh, in Detroit are named after local slave owners, people who owned uh, human beings as property in Detroit. So um, streets like Macomb, Campo, Bobion, McDougal, Abbott, Brush, Cass, Hamtramck, Goyne, Meldrum, DeQuinder, Buffot, Grosbeck, Libernois, and Rivard are all named after slave owners. Right? We name our street. We don't name our streets after poor people. We name our streets after wealthy people, after landowners, and wealthy people and landowners in this period also owned other human beings. Right? That's that was the basis for a lot of wealth. 
And in fact, it was the basis, the, the, the single greatest basis for wealth in the United States besides land. It wasn't the labor that slaves were doing that was so important to the economy. It was the actual bodies themselves of slaves in which the largest percentage of income in this country was held, right? So it was actual, the slave trade, even though the slave trade ends between Africa, there's a slave trade internal to this country, which is the most important part of the economy of this country uh, before the Civil War, other than selling and land. Um, the first black man that we have an absolute um, uh, record of in Ypsilanti is a man named Edward Matavy, and uh, that record is from 1825 and the first territorial election in Michigan, right, to the Territorial Assembly. So this is actually the election that begins Washington County uh, and uh, begins the, the first election in Michigan Territory. And Edward Matavy is a black man, and he tries to vote here at the Trading Post where the Riverside Arts Center is. And a man named John Meldrum gets up and says, Edward Matabee should not be able to vote. He was born a slave on my father's farm in Detroit and is not a free white man. So the first black person in Ypsilanti was born a slave, not in the South, but in Detroit and was denied the right to vote, right? That's the first actual uh, record we have of a black person in Ypsilanti, born a slave in Detroit and denied the right to vote. And I think that should challenge us a little bit about North and South and about Ypsilanti's own history in regards to this. The Underground Railroad in the landscape. We are so used to seeing these pictures of these lines in the map of the roots of the Underground Railroad. And I'm going to tell you, these are almost all made up in somebody's mind. <laughs> you know, there are so many myths about the Underground Railroad. One of the things you're looking at when you're looking at this map is just the way anybody would travel between two areas, right? Uh, so these maps that, that we think of um, as being definitive and as showing routes of the Underground Railroad, that's not how the Underground Railroad worked. The Underground Railroad was largely ad hoc. It was largely determined by the people escaping themselves, right? Uh, there were communities of people who organized together to get people to freedom, uh, and, you know, across across the landscape, and they would have worked together over time. And so you would have lots and lots of individual sort of relationships that allowed the Underground Railroad to happen. But there wasn't like a national organization called the Underground Railroad where people got together and planned these activities at all. And sometimes, you know, one route to freedom was the one route to freedom. And then that, that route closed down as soon as those relationships ended or somebody moved away. There are very, very, very few people who give their lives over to, to work on the Underground Railroad. Before the Civil War, there are maybe a dozen or two dozen people in the whole country who have given their life over to this work, right? Uh, Harriet Tubman, John Brown, those kinds of people. But for most people who are active on the anti-slavery, in the anti-slavery movement, it's like an activity today. It's, it, it, it doesn't take your whole life, right? It's, it's something you give a little bit of here and there as you can, by and large, unless you're truly committed to the movement, truly committed to the movement. So a lot of what you're seeing here is, is the way we tell these stories uh, and the way we want these stories to fit into um, uh, certain myths. And a lot of the myths we have around the Underground Railroad are centered on white support to a Black freedom struggle. There was white support to a Black freedom struggle. Absolutely. It was such a small minority of white people <laughs> at the time, though. And we'll look at the numbers of that in Ypsilanti. One of the things that's really interesting is following these um, communities through the landscape. So what you're looking at here is a map of the kind of Ohio River Valley. And you see names there, Liberia, Mount Pleasant, Lambert Lands, Richmond, Richland, and Lost Creek. And these would all be what I call Black refuge, not refugee, Black refuge settlements just north of the Ohio River in the kind of mountains and hills of the Ohio River Valley where black people who escaped from slavery or who were emancipated or were freed in whatever way they might've been freed, uh, gathered together in relative isolation from white racism and white supremacy to have some elements of self-determination, right? So you see all of these communities are where Ypsilanti families come from. And you will see these communities, Lost Creek, Richmond, Richland, Lambert Lands, Mount Pleasant, Liberia, move to a person to Canada. 
uh, after 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Act. Because what happens is after the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, these communities become centers of where slave catchers will now go, right? So, so what places that were refuge places become places where slave catchers know to go now because they have the legal framework to go and take human beings from these places after 1850. So that means that if you, you know, you had lived in Lost Creek or Richmond for a generation or two, after 1850, you had to leave. So we see whole communities getting up and going to Canada. And I wanna give some names because these are names of Ypsilanti families that exist in Ypsilanti today. The Lost Creek Settlement in Indiana, the artist Freeman Epps Goins Bass and Anderson family in Ypsilanti comes from, Richland or Little Africa, the, the Kersey family from Ypsilanti comes there, the Sherman Hill, Wallace and Dews family. The Dews family is an important family here on the Underground Railroad. Richmond or the Weaver Settlement, settlement Artists Roper, Anderson, Collins, and Epps, Mount Pleasant in, o in Ohio, Roper, Wilson, King, and Anderson, Morgan Center in Ohio, Anderson and Pettiford, and Liberia, Pennsylvania, Travis and Rickman families who are also uh, here in Ypsilanti. Um, one of the things too is there are real debates within the movement. There is not one abolitionist movement. There are real debates. Every picture you're seeing here of people are leading abolitionists in the 1840s and 1850s. All of them would have visited Ypsilanti. So you see Frederick Douglass, Mary Ann Shad, Martin Delaney, William Lloyd Garrison, and Henry Bibb. All of these major figures in the anti-slavery struggle would have visited Ypsilanti. And here's some of the debates specifically within the black community about uh, abolitionism and how to approach the struggle against slavery. Are we, is this moral suasion? That was the Garrisonian argument. We're trying to argue that slavery is morally wrong and we will not take part in political institutions that have anything to do with slavery. So that was Garrison's position. Frederick Douglass's position began like that, but he changed his position to say, we have to engage in the political struggle and try to get people elected, even though black men by and large in the North couldn't vote and black women certainly couldn't vote. What kind of organization to have? Should we have independent black organizations? Should we have secret organizations? If you can't vote, if you don't have legal rights, how do you have a legal organization? You know, what kind of, what are you demanding in your organization? Are you demanding an end to slavery? Are you demanding black rights? Are you demanding full citizenship? Um, those are all the kinds of questions that both black and white abolitionists are asking. You know, we, we looked at the 1850s Fugitive Slave Act and the black codes. Do we even stay in the United States? Should we try to get to Canada or back to Africa or to Haiti? And then for white, uh, people who are against slavery, some, you know, you could be against slavery and be a deeply racist person, right? So some of the white folks like the Norris family here in Ypsilanti who are considered against, against slavery were against slavery because they were against having black people in the United States at all. And so the Norris family, even after slavery ended in the Civil War, uh, supported colonization and the return of Africans, African Americans to Africa, whether they wanted to or not. Um, so, you know, there's lots of different questions. And then you have Martin Delaney saying, well, no, black people should go to Liberia. There we can be, we can be leaders of our own communities, right? And so you have lots of different ideas about uh, our, the black relationship to the United States. Resistance to work with or against the system. Do we ask for aid or do we try to get, do we try to do this just on our own, right? Because how can we be free if somebody's helping us be free, right? We're not really free unless we make our own freedom. What kind of allies and on what basis do we do this? Is the constitution a problem or a solution to slavery? That was a major debate within the abolitionist movement. Is the constitution something that can can help abolish slavery or is it irredeemably a pro-slavery document as Garrison thought it was? Are we Americans? Uh, America doesn't think we're Americans. Do we think we're Americans? And what about Haiti? And Haiti was a place where there was a, a revolution against slavery led by um, people enslaved themselves that created the second and only real you know, non-racist republic in, in North America and Haiti. So a lot of people didn't look to the United States as a solution to their problem at all, but they looked to the Black Republic of Haiti as the solution to their problem. And as always, what about after slavery? 
what rights will we have here after slavery? You can see that these debates were not simple debates. And you can see that these debates would divide black people as well as they would divide white people and then divide between the races themselves, the different kind of answers you would have to these questions. Where are people coming from in Ypsilanti? Here's a look at, at, at uh, in 1860 where people say they are coming from on the, the US census. And one of the interesting things is you're gonna see about a quarter of the people say they were born in Canada. Well, why would you say you were born in Canada and then come to Ypsilanti to the United States in 1860? Well, because if you say you're born in Canada, then the, the you don't have to answer the question, was I, am I enslaved or not, right? So a lot of people will answer Canada when they have escaped from slavery. And you'll see that in 1870, after slavery is over, they'll say, no, I was actually born in Kentucky or Tennessee or something like that. You see about 20% uh, were born in Michigan, right? So, so by the Civil War, there's already grandchildren of black families in, that have been here for three generations or two generations in Ypsilanti. I think that's important to remember. The other Northern where people are coming from, again, about 20, 25%, that is uh, those, those black refuge communities along the Ohio River Valley. And then about half claim to come from a slave state. And it's interesting, the states that people say they came from. Of course, it's extreme, you can imagine, are you going to escape to, is it easier to escape from to Canada from Kentucky or Louisiana? Well, clearly Kentucky, right? It's much closer. If you're in Louisiana, you have to go through six or seven slave states before you get to a so-called free state. If you're in Kentucky, you go over the Ohio River. So it's not a surprise at all that the people we, where people are coming from are those states closest to Michigan that have slavery. And at that time it was Kentucky and also Virginia because you have to remember that Virginia included West Virginia at that time and would have been right on the Ohio border. Interesting also is that Carolinas, there's a large number of people born in the Carolinas, North and South Carolina, and they largely would have been free blacks who left the Carolinas after uh, the Nat Turner Rebellion of 1832. And so free blacks were, uh, became incredibly hostile after 1832 uh, to be in the Carolinas if you were a free black or if you were a Quaker, uh, a white Quaker. So you see lots of free blacks from the Carolinas and white Quakers move to Southern Indiana in the aftermath of the Nat Turner's Rebellion. And many of those people will come to Ypsilanti. And again, they were born free for generations in North and South Carolina. Um, parts of the Kersey family are just exactly that. Um, the Deep South, you can see how few people actually come from the Deep South here. So what groups and families were active in the Ypsilanti area in the 1860s in the Civil War area? The Morton family, Griffin, Davis, Stewart, Hamilton, Jacobs, Casey, Crosby, Kersey, Rickman, Bass, Beatty, Neely, Robinson, Travis, Lowe, Stafford, Scott, Augusta, Brown, Cunningham, York, Washington, Bell, Johnson, Sherman, and many more families. Some of these families are directly coming out of slavery. Many of these families have been free for generations. North Star, again, people are going to Canada. Thousands free and, and enslaved fled to Canada in the 1840s and 1850s. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 and the Dred Scott decision of 1857 make that imperative, make that imperative. These communities, I think we should remember when we say Canada, they're about as far from Detroit as Ypsilanti is. So, you know, they're just on the other side of the Detroit River there. And there's a community that is created between Black, communities on the Detroit side of the river and black communities on the Canadian side of the river. And there is a lot of back and forth, a lot of back and forth. In fact, these are the same communities, the same families, the same churches. Um, schools, newspapers, fraternal and benefit groups are established in Canada. And one of the interesting things is you can see these two black newspapers, and these are the first one there is the Provincial Freeman. And that's the first black newspaper in North America edited by a black woman. The Voice of the Fugitive there is edited by Henry Bibb. And you can see the, the very different attitude of these two Black newspapers towards the Black population of Canada. One says, we're the provincial freemen. We're free in Canada. We're staying. We are now Canadian, right? The other is the Voice of the Fugitive. 
we're fugitives from slavery in the United States. We're refugees, right? So these are very different black attitudes towards uh, the relationship with Canada, right? So the, the black community was divided. Are we now Canadian or are we refugees from American slavery? One of the most important settlements in Canada is called Buxton or the Elgin Settlement. I can't um, emphasize enough how important it would be for people interested in the story to visit. Um, most of the settlements that I'm going to be talking about in Canada, Buxton, Chatham, Dresden, Colchester, Amherstburg, all have um, museums to the Underground Railroad. All of those towns are far smaller than Ypsilanti, right? So they all have uh, Underground Railroad museums, and all of the names in those museums will be Ypsilanti names. Uh, it is, they are one community and one family. In fact, to this day, to this day, many people from Ypsilanti will travel to Buxton for homecoming celebrations. To this day, uh, 120 years after people began settling in Buxton. And for a while, in the early part of the 19th century, there were actually special trains that would go from Ypsilanti to Buxton on Emancipation Day. Again, there's some of the names you can see of the Buxton families. If you go to this graveyard in Buxton, I, I highly encourage people to do this trip after COVID is over. It's about an hour and a half away from Ypsilanti. It's a beautiful, beautiful time for a Sunday drive. And if you go to this graveyard, you will see dozens and dozens of Ypsilanti family names. Uh, and this is a really essential, important place uh, in the Ypsilanti story. And I encourage people to go to those uh, museums. Other settlements is Colchester is a small village on Lake Erie and a large population of freedom seekers, including the McCoy family. So if people know about George and Mildred McCoy, Elijah McCoy's um, parents, that's where they would have settled before coming to Ypsilanti. Uh, one of the oldest settlements was Josiah Henson, and he's the man on the bottom right there. It was called the Don Settlement. And Josiah Henson, he is actually the person who was the, the, um, uh, who made the imprint on Harriet Beecher Stowe for Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Josiah Henson was most certainly not an Uncle Tom. Uh, he was um, uh, a leader of the black community of, of Dresden and many um, black families like the Stark, Richardson, Morton, Streeter and Davis families of Ypsilanti would have been taught by Josiah Henson. Uh, and um, in fact, when Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin was first performed <clears throat> as a, um, a play, it would have been performed right here in Ypsilanti within six months of it being produced. Uh, Chatham Town had the largest and most active Black populations in the region. It was called the, the Black Paris of Canada. Uh, uh, we'll meet John Brown as he goes there. Chatham still has a wonderful museum called the Black Mecca Museum, uh, with many Ypsilanti families also connected to that. Also, uh, just naming some more, Malden, Queensbush, Amherstburg, Gore, Windsor, and many other individual or clustered settlements or homesteads throughout Southwest Ontario. There is no way to tell the story of the Underground Railroad of Ypsilanti without these Canadian communities. So let's go quickly through abolitionism in Washtenaw County, what it might look like. White abolitionists were a small, often despised minority. I think this is really important to, to emphasize. If you were a white abolitionist, in the 1840s and 1850s, what you advocated was the people with the most wealth and power in this society being stripped of their wealth and power, and that wealth and power given to the poorest people in this society. It did not get you invited to a lot of dinner parties. You had you If you were a real abolitionist for immediate abolition, it meant you were against the U.S. government. You The U.S. government was your enemy because it was the bulwark of defense of slavery. So to be an abolitionist also meant that you, you know, it was considered something like being a communist in the 1950s or, you know, something like that. You were, you were totally against what America was about and you were trying to bring relationships that were alien to the United States here with your abolitionism. So in Ypsilanti, the Liberty Party is the anti-slavery party. In 1844, there's only 23 votes for the Liberty Party here in Ypsilanti, right? Ypsilanti is a democratic uh, um, uh, uh, party uh, uh, city. Even during the Civil War, it will not become overwhelmingly Republican or anti-slavery. It will not even vote for Lincoln in 1864, unlike the rest of Washington County. 
So uh, Ypsilanti is actually has a, a somewhat pro-slavery even reputation in this period, unlike the, the reputation it has today, which has been an anti-slavery reputation. There were absolutely whites local in Washington County who were intimately involved in this movement. The Beckley, Chase, Glazer, DeGarmo, Moore, and McAndrews families were all involved. The Signal of Liberty was a very important abolitionist newspaper that was produced in Ann Arbor in Lower Town, and it was connected to the Liberty Party. Um, uh, but, you know, you could, if you were Black, could you join the Liberty Party? Well, I suppose you could, but you can't vote and you can't get elected, so what's the use, right? So the Liberty Party is an overwhelmingly white party. It's almost exclusively white because it's about voting in elections, which black people are not allowed to do. Black families like the Arrays, Days, Stewarts, and Ocros are involved. And we see uh, black Washtenaw County involved in civil rights movements and movements for black rights all the way. The earliest reference I have is in 1843, where black families from Ypsilanti go to the Michigan Colored Men's Convention to demand equal rights and the removal of the word white from the Michigan Constitution. So there's never not been a civil rights movement in Ypsilanti. Even when there was, was slavery, people are demanding political rights. Salem Township here in Washington County is a rural center of abolitionism. And uh, if you want to know more about that, Carol Mall's book um, is, is where you go for that. African Americans become increasingly prominent in the abolitionist movement here as their population grows. Nearby Detroit, because of, of its geographic location, becomes a center of Black abolitionist activity. And because of that, it also becomes a center of slave hunting. So Detroit will be one of the few northern cities that actually has a slave pen in it to, for people to be returned back to slavery because so many people are trying to go through Detroit to Canada. Again, black people could not vote or participate in politics as white men could. So the kind of politics you are going to engage in as a black man or woman are going to be different than the kind of politics you are going to engage in as a white man or woman. I don't have time to go into some of these articles here, but there are articles about local activities of white abolitionists on the Underground Railroad. One I do want to point out is Samuel D. Moore, who is a remarkable man. He was a radical Quaker from um, near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And if people have ever heard of the Christiana defense or the Christiana riot by where um, a, a black man named William Parker and his family defended themselves against slave hunters. I, um, the slave hunter was actually the, the so-called owner, was killed in that confrontation. And Samuel Moore and other Quakers, radical Quakers, hid the Parker family until they could get to the Buxton settlement in Elgin, in Canada. Samuel Moore and his brothers were then targeted uh, by uh, uh, white supremacists, pro-slavery people, and had to leave um, had to leave Pennsylvania, and they would settle right at Bemis and Tuttle Hill, where uh, Alban Cemetery is on the south side of Ypsilanti, and there grew around the Alban Cemetery, that there's a little Quaker church down there, a, a radical Quaker abolitionist community. And the Alban Cemetery to this day is a integrated cemetery. It was one of the first integrated cemeteries in this area. So one of the, I, I think that Many black families get buried down there and don't know that the reason why Alban Cemetery is a place where black people get buried goes all the way back to the Quaker tradition. My friend who just passed away, Nelson Freeman, who comes from an Ypsilanti family going all, black family going all the way back to the 1870s and before that into Canada was just recently buried at Alban Cemetery. Um, and uh, uh, Samuel Moore was very active here. He's actually expelled from the Quakers here. Uh, for being too radical and saying that the Quakers need to not just speak against slavery, but act against slavery. And he actually threw cow's blood onto the door of the Quaker meeting hall on Bemis and, and Tuttle Hill as a protest against their hands being dirty with the blood of slavery. And here he writes in 1856, to, uh, the anti, uh, to an anti-slavery newspaper. In view of the direct relation that the state of Michigan through the central government sustains the unrighteous and God-defined system of chattel slavery, and in view of the utter recklessness of citizens of the state in regard to their position in this morally corrupting and God-forsaken government, I have been renownedly convinced in my own mind that it is morally wrong for me to voluntarily sustain it by paying taxes. I therefore, in accordance with my honest conviction of right, 
enter my solemn protest against sustaining said state and national governments by voluntarily paying its assessed taxes. My protest accepted by the agent of government is as follow. And because he's an abolitionist, he says, no, all men and women, he makes sure that he's addressing women too, because he's a good radical abolitionist. Know all men and women by this, that as the state of Michigan through the central government is pledged to sustain and protect the unrighteous system of chattel slavery, that I hereby refuse my own free and will and consent to pay all taxes and sustain said state and national government. Samuel Moore was uh, one of these stalwarts of the anti-slavery movement in this area and his farm and the farm of his brother definitely would have been places uh, that were active on the Underground Railroad. He would end up moving down to Raisin Center and live right next to uh, Laura Haviland, the great abolitionist leader there in a radical Quaker community in Raisin Center. And he's buried down uh, right in Adrian, Michigan, right by Laura Haviland. Okay, let's continue. Here's the McAndrew family. Um, the McAndrew families are a remarkable family. They're from Scotland. They come from a, a dissenting uh, religious position in Scotland. Uh, and th the dissenting religious position in Scotland, meaning not the Church of England, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, uh, Calvinists, those kinds of people. Um, that was a, a real bedrock of anti-slavery activity in Britain. And the McAndrew family had their anti-slavery position already in Scotland. And they came here uh, to Baltimore. Um, and in Baltimore, which is a slave city and a slave state, they opened a school for African Americans, which was illegal in their home. And they had to leave Baltimore after threats from white mobs. They eventually settled here in Ypsilanti. Uh, and um, uh, uh, William McAndrew, you can see he's a cabinet maker. And it says, friend McAndrews is one of your genial men that everybody loves to patronize. Some years ago, he came over from Bonnie, England. And unlike some other Englishmen, he has brought a true spirit to this country of patriot in every sense of the term, a true Democrat scorning oppression and loving freedom for all men. But he is good enterprising workman. He keeps a number of hands employed, not only manufacture the best kinds of work, but also imports from abroad. So he's this is his advertisement in the Ypsilanti paper. And he's advertising in some his anti-slavery position right, in the Ypsilanti paper. Now, Helen McAndrew is a really interesting woman. She is educated, she's committed, she's politically engaged, she's religiously engaged, but she's also a woman where women don't have rights. She also sees that one of the issues in Ypsilanti is not just slavery, it's lack of medical care, right? It's, it's what, once black people are freed from slavery, it's lack of access to all kinds of services and needs. And so uh, Helen McAndrew was determined that poor people, black people and women could get medical services here in Ypsilanti. So she went to Rhode Island on her own, had William take care of the kids and she uh, um, uh, got her medical degree as a, a, you know, as a woman on her own, leaving her family behind. And she came back and opened a a, um, a, a hospital, a salon, you know, a spa, and it, it's this uh, octagon house. Back in the 1850s, if you were a progressive person politically, you had to build an octagon house. It was like having a Prius or something. You just had to do it. And uh, that octagon house was called The Rest for the Weary, and it was right there on South Huron Street, um, near where our bed and breakfast is today. And that also would have seen activity on the Underground Railroad. I do want to say a little something about Ypsilanti on the Underground Rail, because I think there's a lot of myths about it. Um, there's a lot of talk in Ypsilanti about um, um, uh, um, tunnels underneath the city that go to the Huron River. The Huron River was absolutely not a navigable river. Nobody would have tried to escape through the Huron River. There would have been maybe three dozen dams between here and uh, Lake Erie. So you would not have been able to travel the Huron River on a boat down to Lake Erie. So people were not escaping by the Huron River. They were not getting into tunnels and going into the Huron River. That's not what was happening. Those tunnels are all built for water, for water management. That's exactly what they're built for. So if you have a tunnel under your house and you think it was the Underground Railroad, it was not. I'm sorry, it was, it was for the uh, water uh, 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 management in the city. That said, there are a couple of places where we know the Underground Railroad was active in the city. Um, the, the home of the McCoy family on the Starkweather farm, not the Starkweather farm itself, but the home of the McCoy family. 
Uh, we know that that would have been active on the Underground Railroad. And we know that the Array family uh, southwest of, of Ypsilanti would have been active on the Underground Railroad. But by and large, all of the, you know, the, the people who say that my home was active on the under, we have zero, zero, zero proof of that, right? And there is only proof of a couple of, um, of, of places in Ypsilanti where we can say definitively people stayed on the Underground Railroad. Well, why is that? Because most of people who were coming through Ypsilanti on the Underground Railroad were staying in the Black community secretly, right? And, and you did not write about these things. You did not advertise about these things. So we're not going to know about the vast majority of people who came through here. And most, you know, if you weren't being followed and if there wasn't a threat, you came quite openly. You know, sometimes the Underground Railroad was buying a train ticket and just getting on the train and going to Canada, right? It wasn't necessarily hiding all the time. I think that's, you know, like... It, it makes people be so passive and it makes, you know, that's not the way people were. And because it's the Underground Railroad, nobody hides in an attic. It's always in the basement, I have found, right? Uh, but generally, people were living openly here. And if you knew that there was a slave hunter around because you had a vigilant society and people had their eyes around, then you would go to ground and kind of hide and all of that kind of stuff. But mostly, you lived openly, even if you were a person who had escaped from slavery. You would change your name or something like that. But people weren't hiding out in attics all the time. Please, that is not what Black people were doing here in Ypsilanti. The African Ministries, the Order of the Men of Oppression, this is one of the most important black organizations of the pre-Civil War period. It's centered in Detroit and absolutely would have had members here in Ypsilanti. And the reason I know it would have had members here in Ypsilanti, because the African Mysteries, the Order of the Men of Oppression, is a secret revolutionary anti-slavery society embedded within the black Masonic tradition, right? So before the Civil War, if you were a black Mason, at a certain point, you joined the African Mysteries, the Order of Men of Oppression, which was an all-Black organization except for one white man, which we'll talk about in a moment, and was founded by William Lambert and George de Baptiste. William Lambert on the left of this picture is the most remarkable man in Michigan history. There should be statues and schools named after him. If there's one name I would have you remember from this talk, it's William Lambert. William Lambert was a tailor on Jefferson A. Avenue, a leader of the anti-slavery activity in Michigan for 30 years, and another 30 years after that, he was a leader of the civil rights movement in Michigan, active on all levels of the struggle in the state. He founded St. Matthew's Church, and he was the leader of the Colored Men's Conventions. You can read his addresses to the Michigan Colored Men's Conventions going all the way back to the 1840s. And he's an extraordinary thinker. He's placing Black history within the context of African and world history. He's placing civilization, modern Republican ideas in Africa, not just in Europe. He's, he's an early Pan-Africanist, right? And he's also an internationalist and, a, and, a, and a, a revolutionary Democrat, like many people in the 1840s and 1850s were. So he identified with the European revolutions of the 1840s. He identified with the Haitian Revolution, the American Revolution, the French Revolution. He thought of himself as a revolutionary and the struggle against slavery as part of the great democratic revolutions of that period, right? And so he was he was an intellectual as well as an activist. George de Baptiste, there on the right, he ran ships in the Great Lakes. You couldn't be a black person and own ships, but he was wealthy enough to hire white men to pilot his ships on the Great Lakes, secretly bringing people to freedom. Both George de Baptiste and William Lambert were not poor men. They were some of the wealthiest black men in Michigan. Uh, most importantly for this organization, African Mysteries Order of the Men of Oppression is, they were determined that this secret society not just exist within free people in the North or the people who had escaped from slavery, but they would go into slavery itself. And on the plantations of Kentucky and Missouri uh, and the South, there would be uh, uh, um, local organizations of the African Mysteries, the Order of the Men of Oppression. They and their comrades helped thousands to freedom in Canada. People will know about Harriet Tubman. She's an absolute hero. She never made it to Michigan. Uh, she freed dozens, maybe m hundreds during the Civil War. I think George de Baptiste and William Lambert can, can honestly be said to have freed, uh, to be a part of freeing thousands of people, including we know people from Ypsilanti. They immersed themselves in social questions of their time. 
They organized the secret societies like the Colored Vigilance Committee and the African American Mysteries, the Order of the Men of Oppression. These were the people that would go on to organize black troops into the Civil War and after the Civil War would fight for civil rights. They were closely related to other revolution area, revolutionary abolitionists. So when Frederick Douglass came to town, he would meet with William Lambert and George de Baptiste. And the only white member of the African Mysteries, the Order of the Men of Oppression, was a man named John Brown, who I think many people will have heard of. John Brown was intimately related to William Lambert and George de Baptiste. In fact, when Harper's Ferry happened in 1859, it was not at all a surprise to William Lambert and George de Baptiste because they were part of the planning of Harper's Ferry. John Brown was in, and we'll, we'll say more about that, but they were part of the planning of Harper's Ferry. Uh, while internationalists, they favored remaining in the United States and demanding full rights. These are two of the foremost founders of Black Detroit and Black Michigan. Rough justice on the Detroit Underground Railroad. This is some of what they're doing. This is, I'm sure that the activities you're seeing reflected in, the, in these newspaper items are the activities of that African mysteries. And, and what you're seeing here is Black people who are suspected of spying on fugitives for money are roughly dealt with <laughs> by other African Americans. Uh, and because the Underground Railroad is a life and death struggle. It's a freedom struggle in which it's a matter of life and death. And to betray that freedom struggle to, of your fellows was inexcusable. And, and people were killed uh, in, in this process. Uh, and here you see a colored man at Detroit has been taken to the woods and whipped nearly to death by the colored people of that city. They suspecting him to be a spy upon the colored fugitive. He represented himself as one. The manor has been subjected to a legal investigation. So, so you, I, I hope you get the sense of the kind of terror. You know, we, we, we talk about PTSD, uh, but what about whole communities that have PTSD? Whole communities, whole cities of people looking over their shoulders for generations, right? For generations. I think that's part of what we're talking about. We're not talking about just an individual trauma. We're talking about a collective trauma. So let's look at a, just a few individual uh, cases of Ypsilanti folks that we know about. George and Mildred McCoy. George McCoy was born a slave and the property of his own father, right? So that's what slavery did. That's what slavery did. It dehumanized you so much that you could be owned by your own father, right? Uh, at the age of 21, George was freed and he married an enslaved woman named Mildred. Uh, the owner of Mildred would not, now George was able to free himself. So, you know, George is able to free himself because he gets a little, he can, he has to work so many hours every day for his master. And then he's allowed to work an hour in the evening and roll cigars on his own for his own money. And over decades, he's able to buy himself out of freedom. Now that's also the Underground Railroad. Why isn't that, why isn't he also part of this struggle for freedom? Is any, you know, is it any less brave to work for 10 years for your master to drive, you know, like, is that any more of a, of a, of a hard thing to do. Sometimes the hardest thing to do was not escaping, but staying, right? You know, it, sometimes you had to stay. If you escaped, well, what would happen to your mother? If you escaped, what would happen to your children? You know, and so, and you're leaving everything you know behind. So it was not an easy decision to escape at all, even if you had the opportunity. Uh, and so what happens is George is not able to buy his wife out of slavery, so he, they escape together on the Underground Railroad. They go to Colchester, they move to Ypsilanti where they lived on the farm of John and Mary Starkweather. That farm, you can see the building there, is up on North Huron. Now, of course, they did not live in the house with the Starkweather family. They lived on a cabin on the property of the Starkweather family, and that is where what were active in, in the Underground Railroad. He actually, George grew tobacco and made cigars right on that property, which he sold in Wyandotte in Detroit. His daughter, Anna, related in 1913 that George carried escaped slaves in the false bottom of his covered wagon used to sell his cigars. And he would go to the Detroit River. And there was a certain, we even know the name of the ship. It was called the Pearl. Wonderful name for a, a ship to freedom, right? Uh, and we even know that a white man named Mr. Bush um, uh, uh, was the pilot of the Pearl and would worked with George McCoy to get people uh, to uh, freedom in Canada. That, this is George McCoy's son. Elijah, and where does Elijah go to school? 
Does anybody know? He doesn't go to school in the United States. He goes to school in Scotland. Remember the McAndrew family and Scottish politics are, are open. He actually goes to school in Scotland in the 1850s to become a mechanical engineer, returns to Ypsilanti and opens a, um, a, a, a a workshop here. He marries this remarkable woman, Mary Delaney McCoy, his second wife, uh, who is in many ways more important of a figure than Elijah McCoy is. I don't, I wish I could go into the whole story of Mary Delaney McCoy, but she is, in my mind, a more important figure than Elijah is for Black uh, history in this area. On Anderson is another man who escapes uh, from slavery to come to Ypsilanti. He's born Edmund. Uh, and we, we, one of the, you know, Sometimes you make that decision right away. And there's a phrase called being sold down the river, if anybody's heard that slave and that, or that phrase, and that comes from slavery. And that means even if you're held in bondage in Missouri or Canada, to be sold down the river, the river being Mississippi River, to the plantations of Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi was a death sentence, right? So to be sold down the river means to be uh, to sent to, to the worst place you can imagine. John Anderson, uh, he works for the, if you look at a map of Missouri, find Sullivan, Missouri. That's where he would have lived. It's named after the man who owned him, Stephen Sullivan. Uh, Stephen Sullivan, um, uh, we mostly think of pe people enslaved in this country as working on plantations and agriculture. And of course, that's primarily what people did. But much of our industry, much of our infrastructure in this country was also built by uh, enslaved people and worked by enslaved people. And John actually was rented out by his master to the saltpeter mines of Missouri. And so he worked in mines. And when he was coming back from the mine to the plantation of the Sullivan family, he saw a man on the porch he knew to be a uh, slave seller. And he thought, I'm sold down the river. And he immediately started running, right? And he says, so he had to make a decision like that to escape. And he says that he could feel the bullets whizzing by his ears, but he said to himself, keep running, keep running. They won't shoot you because you're worth $1,100 to them. They won't shoot you, you're worth $1,100 to them. He makes it to Chicago and eventually he makes it, and I would love to know this how this happens. He makes it to um, uh, Manchester in Southwest Washtenaw County and he would end up owning a small farm. I don't know how you go from slavery to owning a small farm before the Civil War. He does that. He owns a small farm uh, and he exchanges that farm with E.P. Allen, who's a white politician here in Ypsilanti for E.P. Allen's property on 303 South Adams. And he would move to 303 South Adams. He would marry a woman named Lucy York, who's the grandchild of, of people who settled in Ypsilanti in the 1830s. And they would uh, live in Ypsilanti for decades and have many, in fact, he had three sons all named Fred, Alfred, Frederick, and Fred. So if you're, if you're trying to study the Anderson family, it can get quite difficult. But he, he would have seen his great-grandchildren born on South Adams Street, John Anderson. Uh, even though he escaped from slavery, he would have joined the Union Army. He was in Company A of the 102nd United States Colored Troops and would have participated in the Civil War in liberating thousands of people in the plantations off the coast of South Carolina. So he is not just a person who freed himself. He also helped free other people. I want to say a little bit about what happened to the Sullivan family in Missouri. Stephen Sullivan, um, John Anderson's owner. Remember, Missouri is a border state. It does not secede from the Union, so you can still have slavery even after the Emancipation in Missouri, Emancipation Proclamation in Missouri. But Stephen Sullivan is found guilty of supporting guerrilla, uh, Confederate guerrillas. Uh, and because Missouri is not a seceded state, it's a crime, and he's executed for that crime. So John Anderson's owner is executed during the Civil War for supporting Confederate guerrillas, and two of the Stephen Sullivan sons are, uh, are shot by Union cavalry after refusing to surrender uh, in their guerrilla activities in Missouri. So I think the Civil War was a revolution, and it changed dramatically the position of people. So John Anderson, born Edmund, will live the rest of his life as a free man in Ypsilanti, and none of his, the people who owned him would have survived the Civil War. 
H.P. Jacobs, perhaps the most important person, black or white, male or female, to ever live in Ypsilanti. He's self-emancipated. His name in slavery is Samuel Hawkins. He's born in St. Clair County, Alabama. He's also probably the son of his owner. He is enslaved for a long time on this plantation, uh, and he is able to learn how to read and write during that period. And I won't go into how, but I, I give a whole presentation on H.P. Jacobs. In, in the meantime, he's uh, had a wife and children. He uses his knowledge of reading and writing to forge the freedom papers for his family and his brothers-in-law. They steal his master's cart and horses and make it from St. Clair, Alabama to the Detroit River in less than three weeks, which means they were moving. Uh, at the Detroit River, Samuel Hawkins is baptized uh, by a black Baptist minister from Canada. He sheds his slave name of Samuel Hawkins and takes the name H.P. Jacobs, Jacobs being his wife's name. He comes to Ypsilanti, and here he will become the janitor at what is Eastern Michigan University. Believe it or not, the very best job a Black man could get in Ypsilanti in that period was janitor at Eastern Michigan University. So the, you see the two, the leading members of Black society in, in Ypsilanti during the Civil War would have been the janitors at Eastern Michigan University. He enrolled his young daughters who were born in slavery into what was then uh, the Michigan State Normal College. Those would be the first black people to graduate from the Michigan State Normal College. And they would have graduated as 12 and 13 years old at, and from the music school. And they would all become music teachers, his children. And in fact, his grandchildren, the women would also be music teachers. He's a founder of Ypsilanti Second Baptist Church and the local black school, because what happened is black uh, students could go to school in Ypsilanti, but they had to sit in the last two rows of the classroom in the 1860s. Now, did H.P. Jacobs escape from slavery and write those free and all of that to have his daughter sit in the last two rows of, the, of a, a white schoolhouse? No, they did not. So what happens is all of the black families of Ypsilanti withdraw their children from Ypsilanti Public School and demand either full access or black teachers and black principals for their children. And so what we get is the first black teachers and first black principals in the state of Michigan here in Ypsilanti, largely because of segregation and the demand of, of black people themselves. That, that first black principal is a man named Isaac Burdine. He also fought the Civil War. He's a very fascinating person. Um, H.P. Uh, Jacobs and his daughters will go south immediately after the Civil War to Natchez, Mississippi, and there they will found the Natchez Seminary to, uh, to educate people newly freed from slavery. That is now Jackson State University. So the founder of Jackson State University, perhaps the most one of the most important places of higher education in all of African America, uh, was, was founded by the janitor at Eastern Michigan University. And I think that should challenge us all. How many janitors should be leading schools and how many people leading schools should really be janitors? This man who escaped from slavery in 1856 and 1867 is elected sheriff of Adams County in Natchez, Mississippi. He's three-time Mississippi state senator and he offers bills to the rewritten uh, Mississippi state constitution providing for uh, free public education for all, black or white, up to the age of 16. And most importantly, he passes a resolution that means you cannot be re-enslaved for owing money, for being indebted, right? Because there was a whole move to re-enslave African-Americans after the Civil War on all kinds of spurious legal basis. And H.P. Jacobs stood firmly against that. Uh, he was a rival to a very famous, uh, uh, another black re reconstruction leader named John R. Lynch. He's allied with the radicals. He organizes a benevolent society and newly freed slaves to connect collectively by their former plantation. And it's called Jacob's Benevolence Association. Um, at the, uh, his daughters in the meantime return to Ypsilanti and he will come back to Ypsilanti routinely and speak at all kinds of events here, including Emancipation Day celebrations for decades after, after that. And his daughters will live in Michigan. Um, the last one to die in was in Adrian in 1953. So there are people alive today, I'm sure of, who, who would have known H.P. Jacob's daughters. Uh, in this area. Uh, the last thing to say about H.P. Jacobs is at the age of 65, he had been a religious leader, a political leader, and a leader of education, uh, a leader of the economy for Black people, and he also saw that Black bodies needed attention. So he, at the age of 65, got his medical doctorate degree, 
and became a doctor for the black communities of Kansas and Oklahoma. He died in um, 1899 in Natchez, Mississippi. He's buried in an unmarked grave. Uh, his family, uh, his daughters would go on to be the vice presidents of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and some of the most important black figures um, uh, in black women figures in North America, actually. Uh, he is a remarkable leader. We have this mural in Ypsilanti on the corner of um, the, uh, uh, Curry's Barbershop. And that means that we, Ypsilanti, has one of only seven memorials in the whole country for black reconstruction leaders. And I'm very proud of that. Isa Stewart is the founder of Brown Chapel AME. Um, I want to just read quickly. Um, uh, uh, this this article here it says Levi McQuan, um, which is her her uh, grandson, the proprietor of the coupe line, a kind of uh, cab line, has two relics of slavery days that he prizes very highly. One is a corn knife that is gilded and hangs in his parlor. It has a history connected with his grandmother, Miss uh, Mrs. Isa Stewart, who was a slave in Virginia. She was a determined colored woman when she ran away, said she would never be taken alive. She had a particularly narrow escape in Reading, Pennsylvania, where the slave hunters were on her trail. They even came to the house where she was, where she was, but the disguise given by her friends helped to mis mislead them. At another time, while in the mountains, she met five panthers. She always kept this corn knife with her and she would have used it if necessary. I'm sure she did not meet five panthers, but that's okay. The other relic is a conch horn used on the plantation. This she used very effectively one night when 25 showmen surrounded her house in Ypsilanti, meaning there was a racist assault on her house in Ypsilanti. When she refused them admittance and they threatened to break down her house door, she rushed for the horn and from the second story window gave some blasts on it, which made the showmen think the day of Jubilee had arrived. It is reported the way the men tumbled over each other to get away was the most lofty tumbling ever seen in Ypsilanti. I think this is one of the most remarkable little pieces of news we have about people who is, and it gives you a sense of who this woman was and also the kind of hostility people faced even here in Ypsilanti. She's a founder. She gave the property for Brown Chapel a uh, AME Church in the 1840s one of the oldest black institutions in, in the entire Great Lakes uh, is Brown Chapel AME here in Michigan. And she was a founder of that and uh, the supplier of the property for that. She escaped from slavery. Uh, uh, I don't actually have time to go into this story, but there's a, a particular story that's important. And if people want, um, they're more than welcome to have a PDF of this and read this. But this is a story of, uh, gives you a sense of how the Underground Railroad worked. And it's about a family here, the Hamiltons, who were tracked down to Ypsilanti by the Chester family, uh, slave owners in Tennessee and Kentucky. And it was George de Baptiste who was able to get them to Canada. Uh, after Laura Haviland, this white woman on the top there, uh, uh, put out word that there were slave hunters in this area. The Chesters um, uh, tried to take into possession uh, a, a free family of black people. You know, they were, they, were, they were scuttled in their attempt to get their own property back and tried to kidnap a free family of black people here in Ypsilanti, but were prevented by doing so uh, by the local black population who put pressure on the local sheriff here to not let them do this. The Chester family, the two, the two men who came up here who owned those, human beings were both also did not survive the civil war um the older one uh whose job it was to be a slave patrol in nashville kentucky or nashville tennessee was shot before the civil war by a person escaping slavery when they asked for their papers and killed and the father was killed uh in fact by a person that he had um held enslaved himself so both the Chester families did not, both of these men did not survive the Civil War. Both were killed by people uh, uh, attempting to escape from slavery. And, and the, the, um, the, uh, the Gordon family uh, changed their name to the Hamilton family and came back to Ypsilanti and was able to, to uh, stay. I want to say a little bit about this because this is the most, perhaps Ypsilanti's most important contribution to the entire story of the Underground Railroad and slavery is a negative one. And that's uh, Lyman Decatur Norris. Lyman Decatur Norris is the scion, the leading son of the most important wealthiest family in Ypsilanti, Mark and Racina Norris. They own half of the east side of Ypsilanti. And the family is deeply racist. 
They're anti-slavery because they don't think black people should be in the United States at all. Lyman disagrees with his parents. He's actually pro-slavery. He becomes ideologically pro-slavery. And he actually goes to St. Louis after getting a law degree in Germany to edit a pro-slavery newspaper in, in St. Louis, Missouri. And Lyman Decatur Norris takes the job of defending uh, of, of the family who owned Dred Scott. And he's the lead lawyer for the family who owned Dred Scott. And he is the one who is responsible for winning the case for the Dred Scott, the family who owns Dred Scott in Missouri that makes it go to the Supreme Court. So he's not the one who argued it at the Supreme Court. He's the one who argued in, in Missouri that makes it then go to the Supreme Court. Um, let me read you a letter he wrote. Uh, or this is um, this is the Dred Scott decision, uh, uh, Justice Roger B. Taney. The moment the matter was settled and his master took charge of him again, gave him a house, clothed him warmer and fed, he was, uh, <clears throat> this is, a, sorry, this is first a letter from Mark Norris or from Lyman Decatur Norris to his mother explaining how uh, Dred Scott is better off in slavery than freedom. The, the, the moment the matter was settled and his master took charge of him again, gave him a house, clothed him warmer and fed, he was another man. His face shines with fat and contentment. You can hear his loud guffaw a mile and nothing does him more good than to sit on a box in the sun and abuse poor white folks. Perhaps you say, poor fellow, he don't know any better. Yes, I admit he is poor state of existence, but that is not his fault or his master's. There he must remain a happy and contented slave rather than a poor, squalid, disturbed, free Negro. That is Lyman Decatur Norris. And then the 1857 Supreme Court decision uh, that called the Dred Scott decision is this. In the opinion of the court, the legislation and histories of the times and the language used in the Declaration of Independence show that neither the class of persons who has been imported as slaves nor their descendants, whether they had become free or not, were then acknowledged as part of the people, nor intended to be included in the general words used in that memorable instrument, and so far inferior that they have no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. That is the Supreme Court decision helped argued by uh, Lyman Decatur Norris. Lyman Decatur Norris would go on to become a Democratic congressperson here in Ypsilanti, and he is buried um, at Highland Cemetery. He, is, he played a central role in the uh, story of slavery in the late 1850s, and it was an entirely negative role. And there's probably not a bigger connection between Ypsilanti and the whole history of this period than this. This is the most important connection Ypsilanti has to the Underground Railroad history. And it's, it's not a good connection. It's not one we would want to celebrate. Okay, John Brown in Detroit and Canada. Again, I don't have time to go into all of this. I said a little bit more about John Brown uh, or a little bit more earlier. John Brown is in this area a lot, specifically in the late 1850s as he is organizing for Harper's Ferry. The black community in Detroit and Canada is exactly who he wants to organize to go to Harper's Ferry with him. He does several people from that community, Shields Green, Osborne Perry Anderson, uh, do go with John Brown to fight at Harper's Ferry. Osborne Perry Anderson will be the only black survivor of the raid on Harper's Ferry, and he will actually come back and live in Battle Creek with Sojourner Truth. He died in 1871, but he's here in Ypsilanti in 1863. So even we know that, that actual participants in John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry are even in Ypsilanti coming to meetings after John Brown's uh, raid. Uh, uh, so he, the just to quickly say why Detroit is so important. John Brown did not go to Harper's Ferry to, to start a slave rebellion. I think that's a misconception. What he wanted to do was begin the process of a mass underground railroad. So instead of individually freeing ones or twos or a dozen people, you would free a whole county of people, get them into the mountains in Appalachia and then move them up the mountains of Appalachia into Canada. And part of that route would go through Detroit. So William Lambert and George de Baptiste were waiting for those people to arrive after Harper's Ferry in Detroit. And when John Brown is executed December 2nd, 1859, there is the most remarkable meeting at Second Baptist Church in Detroit where they wait for the news of his hanging uh, and, and express their solidarity to the Brown family and their determination to continue in the cause of which they participated in. There are two 
the, the couple you see there is Sam and Jane Harper. Uh, and they were actually freed by John Brown in a raids in Missouri in 1858. And this picture is taken in Windsor, Canada, where they would live the rest of their lives in the 1890s. And in fact, their child was born uh, on the uh, train going across Southern Michigan and they named their child John Brown. And there are a bunch of Browns now in Windsor, Ontario, who are descendants of this family who escaped with the help of John Brown from Missouri. And some of them are also in Detroit. Here's a few of Atlantis freedom seekers. I have dozens of these articles and these are generally obituaries. Uh, and they will say that people were born in slavery or people were born down south or people escaped. And, and within these obituaries are the hints of the most remarkable stories. Saw seven of his children sold from the slave block. Uh, well-known Ypsilanti man is dead. Um, Eliza Johnson, born a slave, but for the past 40 years, a resident of Ypsilanti died at the age of 86. Stuart Downey, a colored man and ex-slave, died in Ypsilanti, March 16th, age 90. The picture you see on the bottom right is a woman named Dinah Posey. The picture you see in the middle is Isaac and Lucy Berry, an interracial couple who fell in love uh, while he was an enslaved man and she was a young working woman uh, on a... Uh, not from a slave owning family and they fell in love. And of course you, that's not only illegal but potentially very deadly. And so they both had to leave to go from Missouri to Canada but they couldn't go together obviously. She could travel as a white woman openly but Isaac had to travel on the Underground Railroad. And we know he came through Ypsilanti walking on the actual railroad tracks through Ypsilanti. We have a, a wonderful story by his daughter about the aid given to him by black Ypsilanti putting socks on his feet and getting him to the Detroit River to be able to get him over uh, to Canada. Emancipation Day is so important. Remember, that Ypsilanti's Black community is built on the Underground Railroad. It is built in those Black refugee refuge communities on the Ohio River border. It is active in the struggle against slavery for generations before the Civil War. And the, what it celebrates, you know, it's not Juneteenth. It's not Emancipation Day that has anything to do with the Civil War. January 1st, 1863, September 12th, 1862, the, the 13th Amendment. No, it has nothing to do with that. The main day that people celebrated uh, in terms of their freedom in Ypsilanti was August 1st. And that was a major holiday in Ypsilanti all the way up into the 1930s. Uh, it was only after the sort of the last of the last of the old generation and their children died that that Emancipation Day was no longer celebrated here in Ypsilanti. But it was Ypsilanti was it was so important here in Ypsilanti and the black population was so large in Ypsilanti. The black population simply took August 1st off of work every year. And because black labor kept Ypsilanti running, Ypsilanti closed down on August 1st every year. The colored people will own Ypsilanti on the 1st of August. That's from 1900, 65 years after the emanci first Emancipation Day celebration. So I think that's remarkable to think about. And next week, we're gonna be talking about the American Civil War, and we're gonna see black soldiers from Ypsilanti bring this celebration with them down South during the Civil War. Ypsilanti's legacy, well, I, there's so much to say about Ypsilanti's legacy. The legacy of the Underground Railroad in Ypsilanti is Ypsilanti's Black community. It is one of the oldest Black communities in the Great Lakes. The Black community on the south side of Ypsilanti has been there through the Civil War, through slavery, through Jim Crow, through a couple of world wars, through the Great Depression, through urban renewal. I fear that gentrification uh, uh, is, is going uh, to make the biggest impact out of all of all of that history on this community and it is now under threat in a way it never has been before. The import, most important black churches in Ypsilanti, historic Second Baptist Brown Chapel, are all founded by people who escaped from slavery and would have been instrumental in the struggle against slavery themselves. So many homes. If you want to think about where are the homes important in Ypsilanti for the Underground Railroad, do not think about where black folks might have been hidden in rich white folks' homes because those are mostly myths. What we do know for sure, absolutely, is there are dozens and dozens and dozens of homes in Ypsilanti built in and lived by people who escaped from slavery. That's the Underground Railroad in Ypsilanti. That's where you want to look for it. And it will be in the black community, right? That's where it will primarily be. I wanna 
say quickly and look in 1923 at how Ypsilanti celebrated its role on the Underground Railroad. This is a picture, this was a, a pageant for the 100th celebration of Ypsilanti, and it was um, put on by uh, Quirk, uh, Daniel Quirk Jr., whose name has recently been removed from a building at Eastern Michigan University because he liked to do blackface. And so in the pageant, for the history of Ypsilanti, this is how Ypsilanti chose to celebrate its role on the Underground Railroad. While the actual people to escape bondage and their descendant lived just blocks away in Ypsilanti's segregated Southside neighborhood, the reality of life during Jim Crow and emblematic of the ignorance of too many of Ypsilanti's white community have even today of the people that made history and the city it is. The passengers on the Underground Railroad and the children of those freedom seekers who have made Ypsilanti home. So that's literally, in 1923, there are still people in this town. It's about 15% African-American at that time. One of the highest percentage of black people of any city in Michigan. There are many black churches, there are black politicians and Ypsilanti still celebrates its role in the Underground Railroad, not with those black people who did that, but with white people in blackface. And, and I think that should give us a sense of how dramatic that freedom struggle was reversed uh, over these years, that black people are so invisible in Ypsilanti by 1923 that even the story of them has to be done in blackface. Okay, this final picture is a Jacob Lawrence Underground Railroad, the North Star. I really appreciate you sitting through so much of information and there was lots more I wish I could have gone into that I couldn't because we're stuck for time, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments. If you're interested in having this 